Titus chapter number two. Stand with me, please. I know it's already a quarter till. You know what that means? That don't mean a thing. That's what it don't mean. Amen. We're going to preach till Waffle House closes. How's that? Amen. Titus chapter two. God gave me a message this afternoon, this morning rather. I worked on it all day, and uh, I can't wait to preach it. If you have to go, you can slip out. Amen. But we're going to preach till we get done. How's that? Is that okay? All in favor, say amen. amen. Titus chapter number two. Paul's talking to Timothy, uh, young Titus here rather. And here's what he says, verse number seven. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. We're going to preach a little bit tonight on the pressure of the pattern. The pressure of the pattern. Lord, help us tonight as we dig into these verses. I pray that you would help me to be able to deliver your people or the message that you laid on my heart. Lord, what you've done for me. And Lord, the seriousness of these verses that you have, Lord, uh, just uh, driven into my heart today. I pray that you would just bless the preaching in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. In this chapter, Paul lays out a very deliberate and concise responsibility for Titus, a young preacher. The Bible tells us in chapter number one that Paul left Titus on the Isle of Crete that he might set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. So Paul is entrusting this young preacher with a lot of responsibility. But in chapter number two, he gives him a very detailed and a very, uh, 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 I mean a very detailed list of what he wanted him to do in the area of preaching, teaching, training, and mentoring, and he starts the chapter out with speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he begins to give him specific instructions for specific age groups. He deals with the aged men. He deals with the aged women. Then he deals with the young women in verse number four. And then he deals with the young men in verse number six. He even deals with the servants in verse number nine. But in verse number seven, the apostle Paul makes an interesting statement to this young preacher and that's the word and the thought that is on my heart. Now, when you read chapter number two, you find, you find the, if you look at the pronouns, it's easy to figure out who he's talking to and what he's talking about. For, another, for an example, he says in verse number two, he's preaching, he says, now here's what I want you to do, Titus. I want you to preach and teach the aged men and here's what I want you to preach to them. And then in verse number three, I want you to preach and teach the aged women that they may be in behavior. And, uh, and then he gets to the verse number four and he said that they may teach the young women to love their husbands and love their children and, and to be obedient to their own husbands in verse number five. And then in verse number six, he says, I want you to exhort uh, uh, the young men to be sober-minded. But then in verse number seven and verse number eight, he goes back to talking to Titus. Now this is important. It's very important. He's not just telling Titus in verse number seven and eight that this is what I want you to exhort the young men. He's talking to Titus in verse number seven. In all things showing thyself. He didn't say in all things showing themselves. He's not carrying on the thought from verse number six. Not directly. It's indirect. He doesn't say in verse number eight, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that they that are of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of them. He's talking specifically to Titus. Well, that, that caught me as I was reading these verses, the difference in the pronouns and who he was talking to and what he was saying. He goes back in verse number nine, exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters. So he's, he's talking to Titus about some things he wanted Titus to teach these people and in the middle of all this he goes to teaching Titus. Are y'all following me? Well, that word pattern is what got me as I began to read that. Showing thyself a pattern of good works in verse number seven. I looked up the word pattern and it literally in the Greek it means the mark of a stroke or a blow or a print 
or a figure that is formed by a blow or by an impression. And I remembered that I had some leather working tools in my garage and I thought I'm gonna pull this out and I'm gonna use this as an illustration because I want you to see the idea that is behind this word. So he uses the word pattern, which means to be struck or to have a blow. And so what I thought I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring out this piece of leather, a scrap piece of leather that I had at the house, a little scrap piece of leather here. And I'm gonna pull out one of these, one of these leather working stamps that I've got. I've got all the different letters and I have uh, used this one that's got the S on it. I've used this a lot because I put my initials on some stuff. And I thought to myself, I'm going to see how this works. That's, that, that, the whole concept of that intrigued me. So I want, to, I want to take just a second. I want to demonstrate this word pattern. I'm going somewhere with this, all right? Just pray I don't hit my fingers. Actually, I've got a little bolt in here. I forgot I had this. Yeah, you hit your fingers, you talk in tongues, and that's not biblical. Here we go. Well, you know what? I don't want to do that right there. I might break something. Let's do it down here. I want, I, want you to, I want you to get a visual image of what Paul is talking about to Titus, all right? So here, here's an S. Y'all see that on the front row? Can you see that? All right. Can you see what it did to that piece of leather right there? What's on that leather? You sure? Looks just like that, don't it? It's supposed to. That's how it works. Now here's what Paul said to Titus. I want you to be a pattern. I got to thinking about that and I got to looking at that and it dawned on me the seriousness of this subject. Yeah. Stay with me now. Three things I want you to notice by way of introduction. First of all, the pattern, we see that the picture is distinct. I have in this box, as I said, I've got all the letters of the alphabet. Brother Berner, you can look it for yourself. Are there, is there, are there any stamps in this box that you're, you're not sure which letter it is? No, very obvious. Very obvious. Very obvious. Now, they're backwards. They're mirrored right. so that when you stamp it, it's right. right. But every one of them are very clear and very distinct. I thought about this, thought of the pattern. The picture is distinct. There is no such thing as an ambiguous pattern. There's, they're specific. They're distinct and they're clear. Now it's important tonight that we understand this, that our pattern is the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Can we, can we yeah. start there, okay? It's critical that we understand this. The pattern is the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay? That's our pattern. Jesus is the original pattern. Jesus is the supreme pattern. Jesus is the perfect pattern. Can we say that? 1 Peter 2, 21. For even hereunto ye were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. So Jesus is our pattern. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, right? Colossians chapter number one says this in verse 15 down through verse number 18, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. Right. Y'all stay with me now. He, Jesus, is, is, was God stamped on flesh. Right. Okay? All right who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created, that in heaven, that in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I'm saying it again, Jesus is the pattern. He, he's, he's the very clear and distinct and precise pattern that we are to follow. No question about that. But not only is Jesus our pattern, but apparently from reading the scriptures, the Bible tells us that as Christians, we are to live a life that is a pattern to others. 
And this is where it's going to start hurting. In our text, Paul's telling Titus that in all things showing thyself a pattern. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, Paul told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. That's Paul talking to Timothy. Paul said it to Titus. Paul talking about himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16 said, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he said again, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So I wanted to establish tonight that Jesus is the pattern. But we are also patterns. Should be patterned after Jesus. Y'all still with me? All right, so they see the picture is distinct. Number two, we see the purpose is duplication. Right. Yeah. Patterns are used for one purpose, to duplicate. Not just to duplicate, but they are used to duplicate and establish continuity and unity. When I'm doing carpentry and I need to make a lot of the same things, I make a pattern. Okay? When I was framing houses and we were going to cut the rafters and put on a house, we would, we, would, we would make two, Brother Brett, we'd make two rafters, cut them on the, on the saw benches with, the, with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the, the, all the angles and the bird mouth and the rafter tail cut, all of that, and then we would take them up, we would hand them to the guys on the roof, they would set it on the wall, they would put it up there and make sure it fit, make sure it matched, we would try it on one end of the house and go to the other end of the house, check it again, and then we would take those rafters down, hand one of them down, and the carpenter, the saw man, would take a big old pencil and write P-A-T on the side of it. That's the pattern. And then, instead of taking his framing square and individually marking every single rafter tail, he would just use that one rafter as a pattern and trace it out on all of those two by six or two by eights to make sure that every single rafter was exactly the same. It was the pattern. When I'm cutting step stringers for a deck and those stringers that you have to cut out of a two by 10, it takes forever to do it with a, with a framing square, but you do it. You don't want to do it twice. So you make one good set of stringers and then you use that for your pattern and that way all of your steps are the same. Are y'all following me? I hope this is not boring because this is good stuff to me. Some of you ladies looking at me funny. Dresses are made for patterns. Have I got you now? Dresses are made from patterns. All right. Patterns ensure oneness and unity. Now today, there's a word that a lot of people like to use and that is the word individuality. Preacher, I'm just, I just have to be myself. I have, to, I have to express my individuality. And the Bible's clear, we're all many members with many gifts that God has placed into one body. All right, but the body is fitly framed together. There's no problem with you expressing your individuality, as we say down south, as long as you ain't gomming everything up. Does that make sense? Your individuality does not take precedence over the whole thing fitting together. All right, we're commanded, the Bible's clear, to have the same mind, same heart, same purpose, same goals. Philippians chapter three, verse 16. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, Paul said, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul said it like this in verse four, five, and six. There are diversities of gifts. but the same spirit. Come on. There are, he goes on to say in verse number five, there are differences of administrations. 
but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Your individuality can be an asset as long as it submits to the one Lord, the one God, the one spirit, the one rule, the one mind. Is everybody still with me? In other words, you ain't gonna like this. Our individuality must come under subjection with the pattern. Right. Right. We see the purpose is duplication. But then thirdly, we see the pressure is deliberate. For the pattern to accomplish its purpose, there must be pressure involved. Now, whether you're using a hammer and a piece of leather like I just did and you're stamping, uh, you're stamping your, le- your initials on a keychain or on a belt. I watched a video the other day on YouTube of them making saddles. What a, man, that was absolutely unbelievable. That's a lost art, by the way. And they took huge hides, leather, big old pieces of leather, and he reached over in this bin and he pulled out these patterns and he traced them out and cut them out with a razor knife, all these random looking weird shaped pieces of leather. And then when he got finished, there was a stack of weird, it didn't look nothing like a saddle. But when he got done, he started putting it together and building this saddle and it was absolutely amazing. And all the intricate leather work and all of the pounding and the hammering and all the things that had to be done. The point I wanna make is this. There was pressure involved. Whether you're using a leather stamp or you're using a metal stamp, there's pressure involved. Ladies, whether you're, uh, when you're using that cute little cookie cutter on the kitchen counter with the kids and cousins at Christmas, say that five times fast. (laughs) There's pressure involved with those patterns. Huh? Remember the Play-Doh when we were kids? Here's what I discovered as I read this chapter in verse number seven. There's pressure involved in being a pattern and it is very deliberate. But then the more I thought about it, the more pressure I started seeing. Are you ready? In this story right here, in this chapter right here, there was pressure coming from God on Paul to write this letter. If you believe that the scriptures is holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So there was pressure from God on Paul to write this letter to Titus. Then there was pressure from Paul on Titus to be a pattern. But then there was pressure on the aged men, aged women, young women and young men to respond to the pattern that Titus was to them. Y'all still with me? Let's back this train up. So that little stamp that I made there, that little S that I put on this piece of leather, there was three kinds of pressure. There was pressure on the hammer. That was me. There was pressure on the stamp when I was hitting it. And then there was pressure on the leather from the stamp. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying this this matter of being a pattern involves a lot of pressure. Now here's what I found out about Baptist. They don't like pressure. I feel like I'm being pushed. You are. I feel like I'm being coerced. Yeah. Kind of are. I feel like I feel like I'm being backed up in the corner. Good. Join the club. If you think for one second, when you're sitting out there in that pew and you're backed up in the corner and you're feeling the pressure and the heat's being turned up, that it's you are the only one that's happening to, wake up and smell the coffee. I promise you, when I was sitting in yonder in my office, it was on me before it got on you. Huh? God will put pressure on me to get me to do what he wants me to do And now the pressure's on me to put the pressure on you to do what God wants you to do. And the pressure now is on you to respond to the pressure of the pattern. Come on, y'all. What is God doing? 
God's trying to establish some continuity. God's trying to establish some unity. God's trying to get all of his people on the same page with the same mind, same heart, and same goal, headed in the same direction, rode in the same direction, so we'll all look like Jesus. How's that? It's pressure on the preacher to compel God's people to be patterns. There's pressure on the people of God to be in all things a pattern of good works. And then there's pressure on the people around us to follow our example. See, here's what Paul said. Paul said, I want you to preach to the aged men, aged women, young women, and young men. Oh, and by the way, I don't want you to just tell them what to do. I want you to show them what they're supposed to do. I want you to be a pattern to them. I want them to hear you. I want you to, verse number one, speak the things which become sound doctrines. Tell them what they're supposed to be doing. And then I want you to show them how to do it. Everybody still with me? Three specific things that the Apostle Paul focused on in verse number eight and nine. Let me give them to you real quick. Number one, there's pressure to be a pattern in our deeds. Look at what he says. Verse number seven, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of Good works. What about that? The Bible talks about that a lot. We see the emphasis on good works. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. That's the importance. That's the emphasis that is placed on good works. God has ordained that we do it. In tight, look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Not drudgingly, not, not hesitantly, not with a bad attitude, not because they're pressured, not, not because they're coerced, not because they have to, not because they have to be qualified for a position or a job or a ministry. No, zealous of good works. Look at chapter three, verse number eight. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, have you believed in God tonight? Say amen. amen. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. We see the emphasis on good works. We see the effects of good works in Matthew five sixteen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You got the emphasis on the good works. You got the effects of good works. Then you got the explanation of good works. I looked the word good up in verse number seven. You say, well, everybody knows what the word good means. Do you? I mean, that's the word that's supposed to describe our works. Here's what the word good means in this verse. Copy and pasted right straight out of the concordance. You ready? The word good for good works means beautiful, handsome, excellent, eminent, choice, surpassing, precious, useful, suitable, commendable, admirable, beautiful to look at, shapely, magnificent, excellent in its nature and characteristics, genuine, approved, and precious. That's the kind of works that we're supposed to be a pattern of. Come on, y'all. That's the kind of works that we're supposed to be modeling. Our pressure to be a pattern in our deeds. See, we're living in a generation today where people don't want to be told how to live. Now listen to me. You say, but I'm not a pastor. Titus is a pastor. Timothy was a pastor. Paul was an apostle. Of course they're supposed to be examples. Of course they're supposed to be patterns. Of course they're supposed to be. They're in leadership positions. You're missing what I'm saying. Paul is telling Titus to be a pattern 
so that the aged men, aged women, young women, and young men would know how they were supposed to live. So even if you don't think you are a pattern, you're supposed to follow the pattern. Am I, am I right? There, nowhere in my Bible do I find two sets of Christians, those that are trying to please God and those that just do whatever they want to do. I don't find that. Listen to me, there are qualifications for the bishop. That's in chapter one. There are specific qualifications for a bishop and there are specific qualifications for a deacon. People that don't fit those qualifications can't hold those offices. But don't think for one second there's two sets of rules for Christians. <laughs> and don't think for one second that when you get to heaven that God's going to say, well, I don't know why you went to the trouble to live up to all the qualifications of a bishop or a deacon. You wasn't even one. Where do you think you pick deacons from? Where do you think they pick the deacons from? Stay with me. This is deep. I don't want to lose you right here. Every one of those men that were picked, handpicked by the church to be deacons because they were so spiritual and Holy Ghost filled and qualified, guess what? Before they were deacons, they were not deacons. And they was doing all of that. They were living that way. They didn't do that stuff because they was a deacon. They were asked to be a deacon because they was doing that stuff. There's not two sets of rules in the Bible. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm a pattern. All right, but you're still supposed to follow the pattern. So we're right back where we started. And last time I checked, the stamp mark matches the pattern, even if it's not the pattern. You know it would be awesome to have a church full of people that realized that they were supposed to be a pattern. Well, preacher, I've got some areas in my life that I've seen, I've, I've seen, to, seen to got it going on in some areas. But there's some other areas that's just not going to happen. In all things, verse 7, in all things. I'm pretty, much, I'm pretty sure that's what your Bible says if you've got a King James. Yeah. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. That's our goal. Everybody okay? Yes, the pressure is on to be a pattern when it comes to our deeds. Secondly, the pressure to be a pattern in our doctrine. Come on. Come on. Huh? In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Make no mistake. What you believe will be portrayed in your actions. Right. Yeah. Your life reflects the doctrine that you hold. Amen. Your doctrine is not what you believe. Your doctrine is what you do. And I'm fixing to prove that right here from the book of Titus. All throughout the book of Titus. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as it hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Not just what he's saying, it's what he's doing that's convincing the gainsayers. Have you ever heard the saying, your, your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear a word you're saying? Right. Look at chapter 2, verse number 5. He told the young women, he said, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Watch this, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know you can blaspheme the word of God by your life? Right. Yes. Amen. Look, at, look at verse number 10. Not purloining, he's talking to the servants, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Adorn it. It's not just what you believe, your doctrine's what you do. 
And we are to be a pattern to the believers in our doctrine. In other words, if we say we believe it, we better do it. Stay with me now, fix and get, fix and get tight. If you, won't, if, you won't, if you won't let your face drop and you won't look down at your watch, everybody won't know I'm talking to you. Just stay with me. You can say you believe, but if you don't obey, you don't believe. Right. James said, show me your faith by your works. If you say you believe in prayer and that God hears and answers prayer, but you don't ever pray, you don't believe in prayer. If you say you believe that lost people that never hear the gospel die and go to hell without God, but you don't ever tell anybody the gospel that's lost, you don't really believe that. That's right. You say you believe that you're supposed to give, but if you don't give, you don't really believe it. And we could just stand up here all night and just grab hypothetical after hypothetical out of thin air. But at the end of the day, you're supposed to be a pattern. I'm supposed to be a pattern. All of us Amen. are supposed to be a pattern to others about doctrine. I told you it's going to get tense in here. Sound doctrine is not just what you believe, it's what you do. Right. Notice, notice the doctrine that he told him to have in verse number 7. Showing. Showing. This is a doctrine that's, that's evident. This is a belief. This is a system of beliefs that is obvious to other people. Right. Am I right? Yeah. All this is about showing. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. It's, he's talking about showing. Verse 7, in all things showing thyself. Not, not showing off. Not showing off but because you're doing it, it shows. And people see it. Sound doctrine. Showing uncorruptness. Uncorruptness. That means incorruptible. What it means. It means with integrity. It means soundness. The word gravity. This is the characteristics of a thing or person which, it, it, which entitles it to reverence and respect. Come on, y'all. Reverence and respect, dignity, sanctity, honor, purity. Every believer in this church should have doctrine that when you show it, this is the response people should have to it. Not, this isn't just for the pastors. Not just for the staff members. This is for everybody. That is if you fit in the category of the aged men, aged women, young women, or young men. Or the servants. That would be you kids. I have to do everything for your parents because they tell you to. Listen to this. Sincerity. You ready? Incorruption. Here's what it means. Perpetuity. Purity. Sincerity. Incorrupt. All three of these definitions for the doctrine that we're supposed to show in verse 7 pretty much mean the same thing. Incorruptness, gravity, sincerity. In other words, not playing. It's real. It's real. It's not a show. It's not pretense. It's not something that you put on when you go to church and you take it off when you get in the car. It's not something you're one way at church and another way when you're at work. Thirdly, I'm hurrying, we see the pressure to be a pattern in our dialogue. Verse number eight. Right. He's talking to Titus. He gives him several very specific pieces of instruction here that pertains directly to him being a pattern. And one of them was sound speech, verse number eight. Show thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uh, uncorruptness, gravity and sincerity and sound speech that cannot be condemned. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Paul is exhorting Titus to be a pattern of sound speech. Are you ready? So that all the other believers would know what sound speech looks like. 
Paul referenced the importance of sound speech multiple times in the book of Titus. I don't have time to look at all of them. One of them is in chapter number one, verse number 10. He said, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Paul said, your, your conversation, your dialogue needs to be way different from that. Way different. We're trying to teach these people on the island of Crete. We're trying to set in order some things that are wanting and we are trying to establish a pattern of behavior and you are the pattern to show them what sound speech looks like. Paul placed a whole lot of emphasis on the believers being sound. The word sound is used multiple times throughout the book of Titus. Chapter one, verse nine, he talks about sound doctrine. Chapter one, verse 13, that they may be sound in the faith. Chapter two, verse one, again, sound doctrine. Chapter two, verse two, sound in faith. Chapter 2, verse 8, sound speech. That word sound here in the book of Titus, here's what it means. Well and healthy and that which does not deviate from the truth. Your sound speech needs to be healthy. Healthy that does not deviate from the truth. When people hear you speaking, you are a pattern of what a healthy, biblical, godly communication is like. By the way, this includes your text messages. It includes your phone calls. It includes your emails. It includes your social media posts. It includes your social media posts and likes and shares. Because when you like it, you're saying something. When you share it, you're saying something. You're speaking volumes. For you, it's just a quick tap on that little heart. For you, it's just a little quick tap on that little check mark so that the other person will know you saw it and you like it. Here's the problem. Everybody sees it. And when we see what you like, you're saying volumes. And you got aged men, aged women, young women, young men seeing that and going, well, I didn't. That don't match their testimony that they gave in church Sunday. That doesn't match the song they sang in the choir. That was before Jesus stepped in. But you're acting just like you did before Jesus stepped in. So now they're confused because you being a pattern of sound speech just went. <laughs> you ready? If you tighten up again. This includes the music that you sing and the music that you listen to. Or preach your time out now. Hold on just a second. Hold on just a second, Rev. Music I listen to ain't got nothing to do with sound speech. Oh, really? Hmm. Well, I wonder what in the world Paul meant in Ephesians 5, 19 when he says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I think that falls under speech. I'm pretty sure in Colossians 3, 16, he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So I hate to break it to you, but the music you listen to does fall under the category of your speech. You're speaking to yourself when you listen to it. Is it healthy? Is it sound? Does it deviate from the truth? Probably not, preacher, but I, I just like it. There's that individuality again trying to trump the pattern. Is everybody still with me? Preacher, what in the world? Right there, sound speech that cannot be condemned. If I pull up beside you at the red light and you got ACDC pumping in your truck with the windows down, I'm going to condemn the daylights out of that. Come on, y'all. Highway to hell? Huh? I have seen church members on social media say ACDC is my favorite group. Come on, tell it. Members of this church. I told you, I ain't preaching to the church down the road. 
You know what, you, you know what your testimony did when you put that out there? Yes, sir. It went in the toilet. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. You just lost all credibility. All credibility. Amen. Tell nobody ACDC is your favorite group. That's not sound speech. That's yeah. some of y'all looking at me like I can't believe. Uh, can't believe, girlfriend, you just did that. No, he didn't. Yes, I did, girlfriend. Talk to the hand. I don't know how to do that. I've been in the ghetto too long. <laughs> Paul was adamant, stay with me, that if anybody spoke evil of us, that they would be ashamed when they discovered it was untrue. Huh? Look at what he says. Sound speech, it cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. If they say something bad about you, it's got to be a lie and they're going to be embarrassed later when everybody knows that they were lying because your testimony proved them wrong. Right, right. Let me wrap this up. Conclusion. There's a lot of pressure involved in this pattern process. There's a pattern on the preacher to preach like I'm preaching right now. Pressure from God to preach like this and pressure from some people not to. A lot of pressure. That hammer right there was the tool. There was some pressure on it. Because I wanted to hit the nail on the head. Come on, y'all. I wanted to hit the nail on the head. There's pressure from God for the preacher to preach. There was pressure from Paul to write this to Titus. And then there was pressure on Titus to be the pattern. Whole lot of pressure. Whole lot of pressure. Whole lot of force. You, I left you at Crete to sit and order the things that are wanting. It's up to you to fix it, Titus. You gotta be the pattern. Right. Whatever you do, whatever you are, However you act, however you talk, whatever you believe, all that, that's going to be what everybody else does. You're the pattern. You're the pattern. Pressure on Paul. There was pressure on Titus. And there was pressure on all the aged men, aged women, young women, and the young men to let Titus influence their life. Pressure. Feeling the pressure now? A little bit of pressure. Let me ask you a question. Are you a pattern? Most of you are probably saying, nope, not a pattern. Well, are you allowing God to let the patterns that he's put in your life influence you? That's good. That's good. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for liberty to preach. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that the Bible is just so clear about what you expect of us as Christians, how you want us to live, how you want us to conduct ourselves, how you want us to be influenced by the Word of God, influenced by the doctrine of the Scripture, influenced by the working of the Holy Ghost in our life, and then in turn you want us to influence others to do the same. Lord, I pray that not one member of Calvary Baptist Church be passive. Nowhere in this story do I find a place for somebody to sit on the sidelines. Everybody's affected by this. I pray, dear Lord, that you would use this message tonight. I pray, God, tonight that you would break our hearts and help us to realize that how we live, how we live, how we Conduct our Christian life affects other people. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have allowed our selfish will, our carnal desires to trump the continuity and the unity and the oneness that you want in the church where we are all, Lord, supposed to be conformed to the image of your Son. I pray, Lord, tonight that you would break our hearts I pray, Lord, tonight that you would help us to understand our role to be a pattern. Lord, I'm not the only pattern in this church. I'm not supposed to be the only pattern in this church. We're all supposed to be patterns. 
Mamas and daddies are supposed to be patterns for their children. Grandparents are supposed to be patterns for their grandchildren. We're supposed to be patterns for the new converts and the unbelievers to show them what a Christian really is. Or we're not going to convince the gainsayers if we're not showing sound doctrine, sound speech, and good works. Take this message tonight, Father, and change lives. Change people's hearts and minds about the Christian life. 